the executive editor of the Associated Press, up next on Carpe Diem. Hello and welcome to Carpe Diem. I'm Merrill Brown, Director of the School of Communication and Media at Montclair State University. Joining me today is Senior Vice President and Executive Editor of the Associated Press, Kathleen Carroll. Kathleen has built an extraordinary career as an editor, taking on assignments ranging from news editor at AP's Newark Bureau to a business editor for the International Herald Tribune in Paris, and then back at the Associated Press as the Washington Bureau's news editor. She's now AP's Senior Vice President and Executive Editor, overseeing a staff of over 2,000 journalists working in over 100 countries. She's also a member of the Pulitzer Prize Board and a frequent advisor to our school here at Montclair State. And in a journalism world in which women are shockingly underrepresented, Kathleen, running the editorial operation that sets the national news agenda, is the most powerful woman in American journalism and perhaps in the world. Welcome, Kathleen. Thank you, Meryl. Thanks for coming, and it's great to have you here. Great to be here. Um, let's start off with a bit of a report card on the state of the Associated Press in a world, uh, certainly in a, a Northern America situation, where lots of journalism organizations are shrinking and covering less of the world than they did at other points in their histories. You're covering the world in a very extraordinary and extravagant way. Tell us where AP stands in that regard. Well, AP's health is good, and uh, a lot of that has to do with the fact that we have a very diverse uh, base of revenue. Uh, not only do we serve news organizations here in the United States, which have certainly had challenges in the last decade, but we also serve news organizations around the world. And we have one of the largest video operations. Uh, if you see a video story from uh, Iraq or Turkey that doesn't have a correspondent standing in front of it, it's very likely AP uh, video. And we have a lot of international customers. Uh, the BBC, for example, and uh, DPA. We have partnerships with agencies around the world, so our revenue base is very diverse, our, our footprint is very diverse, and that helps us weather uh, what is clearly turbulent times, both in North America and starting to feel that way in Western Europe and parts of Asia as well. The genesis of AP, though, was the need of newspapers in the United States to have more editorial coverage, and many of those organizations are not in the financial health they once were. That's how, does, how does that work? Well, the AP was founded 168 years ago by five newspapers in New York who wanted to have, share costs to cover the Mexican-American War. So cost effectiveness has always been a part of our DNA. Um, it's true that uh, as our founders and our owners uh, uh, have experienced some turbulent times, we have found sources of revenue elsewhere that allow us to continue to serve them, but in what is essentially a bit of a subsidized way. And they also represent a significant part of your board and of the governance of AP. They do. How has all that evolved? Well, the boards have, uh, while the boards have been heavily represented by American newspapers, uh, we also have broadcasters on the board and, and are starting to diversify there. But they've been very forward-looking through, uh, through our history. First, at a time when newspapers may have felt challenged by radio some years ago, mm -hmm. uh, AP got into the radio business. And uh, 40 years ago, we got into the audio business. And 20 years ago, we started a video service, both of those anniversaries taking place uh, in this year, in fact. Uh, and so those boards were forward-looking about how we might find revenue in places other than our owners uh, to continue to support our news mission. And that news mission, it's fair to say, is more important than ever to, I think, uh, consumers of news in the U.S., you are the dominant provider of news from around the world to most of those people, especially at a time when mo many newspapers have cut back foreign coverage. Tell us a little bit about how you approach that challenge of being, you know, fairly dominant, I guess it's fair to say, in bringing the world back to the States. Well, I, you know, we never take, uh, we never take for granted that, that um, we have a sacred responsibility to, to accuracy and truth and fairness, and those are our, you know, our core creeds. 
We're not dominant in that there's no one else on the field. Reuters is certainly a worthy competitor for, uh, for us in AFP um, internationally. And uh, we feel like it's important that, you know, there are more journalists out there than not. We don't ever want to be alone on the field uh, because we feel like reading and viewing publics are better served when there are more journalists out working. Those, those outlets may be changing. Uh, certainly uh, that has been the, 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 the picture in the last uh, decade particularly where things have been very robust. Not as many journalists are, are in state capitals where we are in all 50 state capitals. Not as many journalists are in Washington. Not as many journalists are in world capitals. And not as many journalists are, are on the field in, in uh, some of the important conflicts around the world that, uh, that so rivet our attention. So. And you're trying to get into more and more places, obviously. I believe you were the first U.S. news organization in North Korea. That is correct. Uh, tell us about that experience and, in general, how you approach trying to break into new places that are hard. We have a lot of history with doing this. We've been in Cuba for a number of years now, which was a hard place for us to get back into, uh, get back into Vietnam, uh, places like Saudi Arabia, which are, uh, you know, not not the same as some of the others, but it's just hard to get a footprint there and hard to operate because their traditions of free press are, are quite a bit different than those that we're accustomed to here in the United States. North Korea took a lot of, uh, a lot of work, uh, a lot of really Are you still the only ones there from the U.S.? Yes, we are, yeah. Uh, we're the only international agency that's there in all formats. Uh, our video operation's been there for uh, eight years. We've been in the text and photo operation for uh, coming up on three. Uh, so it's it's surprising to people, I, I think, when you tell them that a major U.S. news organization operates out of North Korea, mm -hmm. which seems from afar and even close up a fairly closed place. How does that work? Well, you know, it. We don't wander freely in North Korea, but I also point out to people that we don't wander freely onto military installations in the United States. <laughs> there are a lot of places where you don't wander freely. Um, our experience has been that we, we insist on operating the way that we operate, which is we, wanna, we won't subject our copy or our people to censors. Uh, we do have minders in some circumstances. But our, our reporter and photographer have just finished, we just did a big uh, multimedia package about uh, three weeks ago on a 2,000 mile road trip that they took throughout uh, the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, which is the name North Korea chooses for itself. Uh, and they were able to see things and talk to people that no one had seen ever in the West. And uh, so, you know, we push for what we want. Uh, we sometimes are in conflict with the authorities there. They don't always like what we write, but we have always presented ourselves as being fair and accurate. We're not carrying water for anybody's agenda. Uh, we do not represent the United States government, which is an important point that we have to make repeatedly around the world. And, um, and that we continue to prove ourselves to be credible and push for greater and greater access, and that's what has worked for us in many places, and North Korea is one of them. The most important story in the world, some people would argue, is fraught with challenges for you all, and that's what's going on uh, in Syria mm -hmm. uh, and the ISIS circumstance and so forth, and that is extremely hard for everybody to cover. How are you approaching that? We have a, 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 a person, a Syrian, who has worked for us for many years in Damascus, um, but we have been sending people in uh, in teams. There's a lot of training that goes on ahead of that, and uh, we now are doing it far less often than we did in the early stages of that conflict, in part because you could go in uh, if you you could go in when you knew that that uh, that the rebels controlled a certain territory, and there was only one group of people that you needed to to be sure that you were dealing with. As the, as the fighting forces began to fracture and there were different factions with competing interests in that, in the, among the groups that were fighting the Syrian army, uh, that became too dangerous. And as you know, happily it's not a place where the, the AP has lost anybody, but many, many uh, kidnappings and deaths took place in that area. And we began to deem it just too difficult to go in. We examine that all the time. Uh, we'd be glad to go back again. But right now, it's not safe enough for us to, to go back in through the rebel territories the way we did in the first couple of years of the conflict. That's a very interesting change, or I guess a evolution, of the role of reporters in conflict situations, mm -hmm. right? I mean, there's a long tradition of reporters from this country and other countries covering conflict in 
the most dangerous of imaginable situations, and this one is so perilous in terms of how the press are thought of that you can't staff it or get near there. The, the, it's all different now, Meryl. It's the, the start, this started a little bit in the Kosovo conflict, but it is true now that the, the blanket of protection, if you want to call it that, that journalists had through conflicts that each side wanted the journalists to be there because that was the way they were going to get their story out. And that provided, you know, a welcome mat, a, 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 a bit of protection. That's totally gone. Totally gone. Conflicts are incredibly unsafe now. And the way we have to go about covering them has really changed because the partisans don't really care that you can tell their story. In fact, they may complain that they don't like the way you've told their story, and they have the means to tell their story themselves now, starting with the beheadings, the crude beheadings in um, uh, Pakistan and Iraq uh, a decade ago, more, a little more, uh, to the very high production qualities of the Islamic State videos of beheadings in the last uh, four months. Uh, they tell the story themselves. They don't need journalists, and journalists have instead become a tool and a pawn in their fight and uh, potential uh, kidnapping or killing victims. So you, it suffices, and it's the best you can do to cover that conflict from Damascus, and you do the best you can. Do the best you it, can. It, somewhat inadequately, obviously, because there are no eyes and ears there. I, it, I've said this for years, and it is true. Every day around the world, somebody is doing evil things to somebody else, and there's not a witness. You know, and. If we go to that place and say we must be there and people die, we're not telling that story either. Yeah. You, know, you have to be able to go to a place and tell the story safely. And that, 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 that has shrunk the world for us in quite a, way, uh, quite a number of ways, and not just us. I mean, this is a conversation we have with, with uh, other news organizations all the time. So not only do you cover the news, you're in the news. And you've been in the news <laughs> more often than you may care to remember in recent years, not necessarily for any fault of your own doing, mm -hmm. but because of scrutiny of you from the United States government. Yes. Uh, we just recently had a second major incident in which you called attention to the fact that, a, um, that an AP reporter was being impersonated yes. out in the West Coast. Tell us about that set of circumstances. Well, there was a, uh, uh, there was a, the FBI was investigating uh, bomb threats at a high school. Uh, somebody was calling in bomb threats to a high school. And uh, the way they chose to go about trying to find out who was calling that, uh, calling in those threats was uh, an FBI agent, we learned a week ago today, um, called the suspect, said he was a reporter for the, or she, said they were a reporter for the Associated Press. And wanted, had written a story about these bomb threats and wanted this person, the suspect, to review that story and make sure that it was accurate. In fact, what they had done is planted some tracking software on the story and when the suspect clicked on it, they were able to track him down and make an arrest. Uh, meantime, of course, uh, AP's credibility took a, had a big hunk taken out of it because a law enforcement official was pretending to be an AP reporter. So how did you how did you deal with that, and what's the what's the solution to that problem if there is one? Well, we first learned that there had been a fake AP story when uh, a uh, the Electronic Frontier Foundation filed a Freedom of Information Act request and and learned that there were fake stories. So we were pretty unhappy about that, and we voiced our displeasure to the FBI and the Justice Department. Then a week ago today, the head of the FBI revealed in a little letter to the editor to the New York Times that not only had they done the fake story, they had pretended to be a reporter. We again voiced our uh, extreme concern, our outrage, our unhappiness, and uh, our CEO, Gary Pruitt, wrote a letter to the FBI and the Justice Department on Monday demanding that they cease doing this ever again and that asking that they reveal any other times when they have impersonated us and explaining why that puts our staff and our credibility at risk. And this is the second fairly high profile uh, encounter, shall we say, you've had with the U.S. government in recent years. In the spring of 2013, it was revealed that they had gotten to your phone records. That's Tell right. us how that all came about and where that stands. I was in the Washington Bureau just by, accident, just by happenstance when we got a little email from the Justice Department that said, by the way, we have uh, subpoenaed these uh, 21 phone records of yours, records of these, and they included 
office lines and home lines and cell lines and a fax machine in a bureau that we hadn't been in in six years. So they were being either thorough or outdated. We're not quite sure. Um, we were furious, of course, because the practices post-Watergate of the Justice Department, the Justice Department was believed to be uh, going after enemies of the administration. And after Watergate, put it, it put in place practices where it would come to a news organization and say, we're trying to find something, we, we want to see these records. And you could either go to a judge who could help you uh, sort out what was proper and what wasn't. You had a third party deciding what was proper and what wasn't. Or you um, could object, or you at least had a, a voice in whether or not they could rummage around in your, in your records. Uh, that didn't happen in this case. Uh, we, uh, we objected, and it caused quite an, uh, an international uproar, in fact, uh, a surprising amount of reaction. Uh, we participated in a series of meetings. Our, our attorney, our general counsel, Karen Kaiser, participated in a number of meetings with the Justice Department, uh, uh, pushing for revisions of their practices and getting those in writing. And uh, that work continues today, but I think we're, we're, we're coming to the point where we're reasonably satisfied that the outcome will, will protect future news gathering, or at least give us the opportunity to go before a third party, a judge, and sort out what the government with subpoena power wants to do uh, to a news organization. So I think it's fair to say that the Obama administration has been disappointing in terms of its commitment to any number of free press and government transparency issues. A number of journalists have spoken out about how disappointing that has been and about their performance. How do you take, how do you put all that together in your own thinking? Well, we've been quite uh, vocal about our disappointment in uh, the administration's vow to be the most tra transparent administration in history uh, versus the actual practices. As you know, uh, under uh, Eric Holder and President Obama, the administration has gone after uh, more leak investigations pursuing journalists than all other presidents before them combined. Um, the president does not allow the press in for normal, uh, to record normal transactions of his business. Bill signings, minor things. And I, and I think it's important to say here, Merrill, that this is not a special privilege that journalists are claiming for themselves because we want to be there. Journalists are proxies for citizens in this circumstance. You know, we're there to represent the the people who can't all crowd into the to the treaty room where the bill is being signed, but he's closed those off. He's he's he he um, he has set a policy where secretaries and departments feel that requests from journalists, even Freedom of Information Act requests, which are constitutional, which are law, must go to a press office where a political appointee can decide whether it should be fulfilled or not. This is not a political question. This is a right that citizens have that we are exercising on behalf of citizens. So what do you, so what's the conclusion one should draw from this? Why is it that um, a president who was a constitutional law professor feels this level of anxiety, animus, distrust, discomfort with the press? How did, how did we get here? Uh, you know, the president would have to answer that himself. I can only judge uh, his actions against his promises, and that's where the disconnect is for us. Um, it's true that some social media outlets give him an ability to go directly to uh, the people uh, without going through the press. The danger there is that you have an administration that is never subjected to questions, you know, that, that it's great that they can send out a picture or a tweet, but it's a one-way broadcast. It's not a conversation with the people who put him in office. And that is where um, uh, the role of the press is really important because people ask, journalists are asking questions on behalf of the citizens who can't do it themselves. He's also not giving you a lot of town halls with people who are not friendly who are going to ask questions of him as well. And this permeates official Washington. It uh, does. My friends who are beat reporters and so forth, even at relatively uh, obscure government agencies and so forth are handled with the same distance you get in the White House. And so covering the bureaucracy must, at AP, be harder than ever. It is. It, uh, it requires a, quite a bit more work to just find out. We're not trying to find, uh, you know, evil doings. We're just trying to find out what's going on. What, what is being done 
on behalf of the people who put this administration in office. How are the laws being enacted? What are the policies? How are things going? You know, we still are able to find scoops, as you know. Our, our coverage of, uh, of the Air Force's, uh, the Air Force uh, uh, division that protects uh, the nuclear missiles that are prepared to launch. Uh, the Secretary of Defense is this morning announcing a complete revamping of that division in large part because of stories that we've broken about problems in that agency. So we're still able to, to find out what's going on, but it's a quite a bit more complicated. So I guess it could be argued that this has been a successful um, effort on their part because they've been able to manage the story fairly well, although you wouldn't necessarily know that from off your election results. Do you <laughs> think this pattern of handling the press is now becoming institutionalized in Washington? Absolutely. Each administration is more secretive than the last, um, you know, and, and, and I think that, 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 that pattern will continue, which is why we work so hard to make this an issue that average people can understand so that it doesn't sound like whiny reporters. But if, if administrations are going to shut down the flow of information through the press to the people, then it's the people who've been ill-served here. Um, we said at the top of the program, our conversation, that um, we mentioned the fact that you're a one of the highest ranking women in Amer woman in American journalism. Mm -hmm. That's an extraordinary situation that probably measured by data isn't even improving. Uh, there, it was not that long ago there was a woman atop the New York Times, mm -hmm. newspaper in Cleveland, newspaper in Chicago, any mm -hmm. number of papers. There are fewer today than there were a couple of years ago. What's afoot here? Uh, yeah, you know, I've been involved in a lot of conversations about this, and um, I uh, I don't think there is a single answer. Uh, I don't. I do think that as the uh, profession has been uh, in such turmoil and has been by many, you know, by any measure, shrinking, um, that uh, that the commitments to diversity have been challenged. Uh, I'm proud to say at the AP that uh, we've made a lot of progress there. Uh, I'm very happy with um, the number of women who run significant departments and parts of the AP for us. I think we have a ways to go on uh, getting more leaders of color. Uh, I think um, there's a lot of progress. On, uh, I find the, the gender uh, issue troubling, but even more troubling is the fact that um, the leadership of major news organizations have really been drained of color. Now, there's a lot of progress. Uh, in broadcasting, for example, Al Jazeera America has uh, two uh, terrific uh, women uh, at the helm uh, and other places where that's true. But um, I, I don't think there's a single cause, I don't, and I don't really have any good answer for why it has happened, uh, despite the fact that a, a number of us have been looking at it and studying it and talking about it all summer long. And the data does suggest it's a situation that's got not getting better and perhaps getting worse, correct? I think it, it, this snapshot of now, it is not getting better. Uh, I do think that if you look at the next rungs down and if you look at smaller uh, uh, and mid-sized newspapers that don't necessarily get a lot of attention in this big debate, you'll find there are a lot of women at the helm. There's a terrific uh, woman who's running the Miami Herald, for example. There's been a great woman running the Wichita Eagle for a number of years. There were two women in contention for leading the Seattle Times. and. There, you know, so there, there are women out there. They are not necessarily in the the leadership positions at news organizations that 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 get discussed in the Amtrak corridor between Boston and Washington. But they are making a difference. Um, it, it sounds like, from my reading of your career, um, that y you faced obstacles, but you also got a shot very early on. You didn't have to work your way through the Dallas newspapers, <laughs> uh, women's pages, or whatever they were called at the time. How did all that evolve for you? Well, you know, it's interesting that you mentioned that because um, I got a job uh, when I was, let's see, I'm trying to think, it's this about this time of year. It was in October of okay. 1973, okay. a year we don't care to mention. I was a freshman in college. My uh, One of my professors was the Night City editor of the Dallas Morning News, and he said, we're looking for somebody to write obits at night. And... I got the job. It was better than checking groceries, which is what I was doing at the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was I was one of the first women who was hired who did not have to go through the women's section. Uh, the paper was not particularly progressive at the time, but I did what you probably did in your career and most people did. I volunteered for every cruddy shift and every uh, lousy uh, job uh, so that I could... Uh, 
um, keep working in journalism. And 40 some odd years later, that still worked. And do you have stories to tell of the challenges of the gender matter in your own personal career? I think uh, most of them were pretty early on when I was a very wet behind the ears um, staffer at the Morning News covering the Dallas Police Department in the early 70s. Uh, there was a certain hazing that went on, you know. My, I was assigned a parking spot in the basement of the police department, which turns out to have been the spot where Jack Ruby shot Lee Harvey Oswald. Oh a mere, <laughs> so, a mere 10, years 10 years before. 10 years earlier, yeah. Yeah, 11 years at that point. I think uh -huh. that was 1974. So, uh, you know, anybody who's covered a tough cop shop uh, uh, can, can sympathize. But uh, that's about, you know, not too many other times have I felt that was... Uh, an issue, and I think that had as much to do with me being 19 at the time as anything else. And your advice to young journalists, and maybe even particularly to young women with great ambitions today? You know, find your passion and work hard. Don't uh, sacrifice your life for your work, and I would say that's true for anything. You know, you have to have balance. You're going to be a better journalist if you have uh, interests and passions and, and friends and family, if you choose to have the family, uh, who keep you balanced. and. Uh, um, just be a journalist. People will say to me, "How you know? what is it like to be a woman journalist? And since I've never been a man journalist, I can't answer that question. But uh, uh, you, You've commented before also about, um, about uh, women having it all and so forth, mm -hmm. and you have a pretty clear definition of what it all means, right? I think you have to define what all is. What does it mean to you, you know? I mean, uh, my house is often a mess, you know? I have a spectacular husband who was a, a great partner throughout, and we've traded off his turn to make a career move, my turn to make a career move. Uh, you know, we've managed to make it work, but uh, uh, I don't garden as much as I want to. You know, you make choices. You just have to make choices. Uh, define what all is to you and go after that. Well, we're glad you make the cho made the choice to join us today at Montclair State, and thanks for your support of our university and the program. Thank you very much. I'm a big fan of the school. Thank you. Thank you, Kathleen. If you'd like more information about Kathleen Carroll or any other episode of Carpe Diem, you can write to us at the email address on your screen, carpe diem at mail.montclair.edu, or call us at 973-655-5158. For Carpe Diem, I'm Merrill Brown. Thanks for watching.